Um, we have four talks this afternoon, um, two on Rootback. And then uh, two on um, what I would call surface noise. Um, our first speaker is Florian Meinert from Stuttgart. And he's going to talk about studying positive and negative ions via Rootberg spectroscopy. Yeah, so thank you, Hartmut, for uh, the introduction. And let me first thank uh, the organizers. Uh, <coughs> And thank you very much yeah, for, for giving me the introduction to uh, present our results from Stuttgart here. And um, so we recently, like in the last year roughly, we did work on ions as well, but from the perspective of a group that is actually studying ripper caps. And uh, as you may have noticed, when you compare to the booklet, I have slightly changed the title uh, because I would like to uh, focus on an experiment uh, where we use Rydberg molecules to study aspects of uh, negative ions, and uh, that brings up the title, uh, studying positive as well as negative ions using Rydberg atoms and doing precision spectroscopy on Rydberg states. Um, so this is the first part then of the talk. I will uh, introduce our recent work on uh, ultra-long-range Rydberg molecules and try to convince you that these Rydberg molecules can be used as a precision scattering lab to learn about negative ion states. In our case, it will be a rubidium minus um, um, negative ion that we uh, study by spectroscopy. And then in the second part of the talk, I will turn from negative ions to positive ions and show you experiments where we have produced a single low energy ion from a cold, ultra cold rubidium ensemble using a, si a single Rydberg excitation as a precursor uh, to create a single ion, and then we have watched uh, the motion of this ion through the cloud via uh, its induced blockade, Rydberg blockade, on the surrounding atoms. Uh, what I'm not going to have time to talk about is experiments where we used a, a, a huge Rydberg state that was actually much larger than the entire uh, ultra cold gas, and in, in this experiment, we did spectroscopy where we could also see evidence for the positively charged core of that Rydberg state inside the condensate. So I've got to talk about these two topics today. And I will start uh, with the first one, focusing on negative ion states. So at least we have not been very familiar with these uh, um, very intriguing objects, negative ions. Um, you may be more familiar with it, but let me um, give you a few uh, um, properties of these objects uh, to get started. So when we talk about uh, neutral atoms, then we're certainly always aware about the electronic structure of, uh, of, of this uh, neutral atom. If it's an alkali, it has a particular uh, simple structure. We are familiar with the ripper series up to the first ionization limit. But uh, the situation for negative ion states is typically much different because negative ion states are, I mean, uh, much, much more weakly bound the binding mechanism is actually the small polarization potential of uh, that extra electron that binds to the neutral core. And for these reasons, uh, uh, the binding energy of negative ions are uh, typically uh, very small. For example, the rubidium minus has just a binding energy of half an electron. Um, negative ions typically have few or even no excited uh, bound states. Um, but what some of them can have are actually, and, and it turns out from the alkalis, all of them have, have uh, near threshold states, uh, so um, negative ion states that live close to the first ionization threshold. And in this case, uh, this negative ion state can actually be bound by the centrifugal barrier that extra electron has around the neutral uh, perturba on the, the neutral pore. Uh, and this is uh, specifically true for the rubidium minus triplet Tj level. And this is the negative ion state that I'm going to focus on in this work. Um, it has um, a binding energy that is above the first ionization, ionization threshold, about 20 milli electron volt. And traditionally, these um, loosely bound states have been actually studied uh, using either um, <coughs> low energy electron neutral scans uh, in beam type experiments or via um, precise photo detachment spectroscopy. And so in this talk, I'm, I would like to convince you that uh, Rydberg atoms can be a tool that, uh, that 
increase the precision to measure these negative ion states by uh, many orders of magnitude. Um, so uh, let me focus on the rubidium minus triple PJ level now, as I said. This level lies a little bit above the first ionization limit and is actually only bound by the centrifugal barrier due to this um, orbital angular momentum the extra electron has. That's an L equals one state, has this centrifugal barrier, and behind that barrier you can find a quasi-bound negative ion state or rubidium minus. Um, so you see these three dashed lines here. That's due to the fact that you have now a, a triplet state. The two electrons can, uh, can form a triplet. Thus you have the angular momentum of that extra electron around the nucleus, and that can give rise to a total spin, J, that can be 2, 1, and 0. And if you have now fine structure, um, spin orbit coupling in the system, then you can have fine structure of that negative fine states. That's why you have these three dashed lines. But uh, interestingly, if you look into the literature, these, this fine structure coupling in the negative ion rubidium mines has never been uh, observed or measured. And the reason is that uh, classically these um, systems have been studied, as I said, by uh, ultra low energy electron rubidium scattering experiments. And if you look on the typical energy scales that you can reach in such kind of setting on a beam type experiment, and you stop at typically something on the order of 100 milli electron volt, which is, first of all, above the, uh, um, the energy that uh, you have for this weakly bound state. But on top of that, even if you would be able to reach these very low en electron energies in a beam type setting, it turns out because this, this uh, negative ion state is very short lived, it can actually tunnel through this P wave barrier out and just lives for a few picoseconds. And that gives it a width that is typically much bigger than the fine structure coupling. So even if you would be able to, to res resolve the cross-section in such a uh, scattering experiment uh, with a high precision and down at these very low energies, uh, you would actually not be able to res resolve the individual fine structure component just because the lifetime of this state is so short. So um, we did now an experiment uh, in the context of an ultra-cold Rydberg atom that we excited from, from an ensemble of uh, 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 gas of rubidium atoms that was a few microcalvin cold. And um, then you're typically faced with a situation that you have a ground state atom from the gas that sits within the Rydberg orbit. And this object, a Rydberg atom, and this ground state atom that sits within the orbit forms a molecule, an ultra long range Rydberg molecule. And on this slide, I would like to show you that these molecules can now be used uh, to actually measure these uh, negative ion states with very high precision. So how can you understand this? Well, um, again, this is uh, the energy level diagram of this negative ion state that lives behind the centrifugal barrier. And uh, typically in, in, a, in a kind of beam experiment, you would now tune the kinetic energy of that incoming electron that scatters off um, uh, this, um, uh, this centrifugal barrier and the, 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 this negative ion state would lead to a shape resonance in the, in the scattering cross section. So if you have now um, such a Rydberg molecule, you have a Rydberg wave function that is bound by the Coulomb potential. That's the radial part of a, of a Rydberg S state. And if you have a, um, an atom, a neutral atom that sits now within the Rydberg orbit, it, can, it could sit, for example, out here. And uh, in this case, the kinetic energy of this Rydberg electron that scatters off that neutral ground cell atom is actually very, uh, very small, just a few uh, milli electron volt. And you can uh, describe uh, um, this object out here by pure S wave electron neutral scattering. However, if you would have a state now, a molecular state that lives further inside, let's say somewhere here. Um, then you effectively tune now the um, kinetic energy of this electron neutral scattering event. Um, you can make it larger, and at some point you tune it actually almost in resonance with this negative ion state that lives behind that T-wave barrier. And uh, so that would be then um, a molecule that is um, uh, kind of bound by resonant T-wave scattering. And um, why is this now? If you would now measure these molecules precisely, why is this method now so, um, uh, so sensitive? Well, you can actually think of it in a way that you have this very broad uh, negative ion state that decays quickly, but some, you can think of it in a way that this uh, Coulomb potential now in which the electron is bound actually forms a kind of cavity 
uh, for the electron wave function, and due to that cavity, you can now measure this negative ion state very precisely. So, let me guide you, uh, um, for, and because we can measure that now so precisely, we can now ask the question, what can we resolve by molecular spectroscopy of these ultra long range Rydberg molecule? Can we be able to resolve the fine structure of this rubidium minus uh, negative ion state, which is this uh, triplet PJ uh, lab? Going on. Yes. Is it your interpretation is that, is it that you stabilize in a way these, uh, these resonances due to, the, to this presence of the kind of cavity? Is it what you do in it is kind of stabilization? Or? Well, what, what you do in a way is that you kind of, um, you, I think it's better to view it in a way that you kind of scan over this broad, uh, broad um, negative ion state with a very precise um, comp sure, or so, yeah. 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 Uh, that, is, that is actually formed by the presence of the Coulomb potential. So you have a very precise uh, um, atomic line, the Rydberg line, that you now kind of uh, scan across this, um, uh, this resonance by choosing uh, the uh, principal quantum numbers. Okay, so let me uh, quickly um, explain to you how uh, we describe these molecules typically. Uh, and then I will show you the experiments and uh, show you evidence for this in orbit interaction in the rubidium mines. Um, so, as I said, uh, the uh, molecule forms by having a very large uh, Rydberg orbit with the electron on a, on a high lying orbit and a neutral atom that uh, sits within the orbit and scatters off this uh, ground set atom. And um, to describe uh, these molecules, uh, we uh, can use a Fermi pseudo type potential that um, uh, essentially uh, describes the scattering in here by a contact interaction, a delta function interaction, associated or with a strength that is given by a scattering length. And so uh, to first order approximation, and when this rubidium atom is far out, um, let's say in the first lobe of the, of the Rydberg electron wave function, the lobe that is furthest out, then you can describe that purely by S wave scattering. But now, when this P wave scattering process here becomes important, and specifically when it becomes resonant, you have to take into account P wave interaction to describe the molecular structure, again via a Fermi type, a super potential type approach, and with an associated P wave scattering length. And uh, this P wave scattering length is now certainly um, influenced by the presence of this. Um, uh, of this modern rubidium minus state behind the barrier. Uh, it will undergo a P wave shape resonance. And if you have now um, fine structure in this rubidium minus, that will actually lead to three different scattering lengths or three different uh, scattering phase shifts. One phase shift associated with each of these um, negative ions. Okay, so how do we do the experiment now? Let me start off with the simplest molecules that live out in this outermost well and that are completely or very well described by pure S wave scattering first. Uh, what we do is we do ripper uh, excitations uh, in an um, electric field cage with which we can control stray electric fields to a level of about one millivolt per centimeter. And then we do two photon spectroscopy to ripper S states in rubidium. And then what you can see is that uh, detuned from the bare atomic line, you get uh, additional peaks that correspond to these uh, molecular states, these ultra long range triple molecule. And for this outermost uh, state here, we can describe them all by S wave scale. Um, there's also um, states that may have two atoms in the Rydberg orbit, those are trimers, or you can have uh, states that have three atoms in the Rydberg orbit. Uh, but all of them are so, so far described by pure S-wave interaction. Um, if we want to see now the effect of the P-wave interaction, in particular the, the spin-orbit coupling in the rubidium minus, we have to find the molecular state that is dominated by this P-wave scattering. And as I said a few slides before, you find them when you go to, sh to smaller internuclear distance, where the kinetic energy for this electron neutral scattering process increases and approaches the P-wave shape resonance. And in rubidium, it turns out uh, you uh, can find that, uh, such a state um, uh, for a 31s Rydberg, um, Rydberg uh, orbit at an in internuclear distance of about 900 pole radius. And so this calculation here is again such a Bohn-Oppenheimer potential energy curve for these molecular states. And this 
um, deeply bound state here is actually a state that is very much dominated by P-wave interactions. And if you look closely here, you see that uh, this molecular potential is split up into a triplet. And this triplet is exactly due to the fact that you have these three negative ion states and this spin orbit coupling in the negative ion. Um, again, to, to sum up, um, you have, when you have such a P-wave dominated state, uh, that's, this, this can split up due to the spin orbit interaction in the rubidium minus anion state. And uh, we just have to do precise spectroscopy now on this Wilberg molecular uh, <coughs> states to uh, identify this. And this we did. We started out uh, at principal quantum number n equals 35 and identified all the lines that we see um, precisely. Then we did very precise uh, or very, um, uh, uh, we did scans over a whole range of, of, of principal quantum numbers to really identify which line is actually which molecular state. That's not so easy because you can also have these primer states and quaternary states. So you have to kind of make a, a systematic study to find out which state is which. Uh, we, we directly found the, the S-wave dominated state that is far out in the outer, outermost globe of the Rippberg uh, orbit. But the state that I would like to, uh, um, uh, to focus now on is this state here, the state A. And so we have traced this over a range of principal quantum numbers. And actually, really at 31, where we have shown the theory plot before, we see that multiplet structure emerges when we do spectroscopy on this state. Um, and this multiplet structure, it's actually a duplet, and I will show you in a bit why it's a duplet. This um, uh, is a pure effect of this spin orbit interaction now in the video minus. Uh, so this is the data for, uh, for 31S. Um, and so you may ask now, why, why is it a duplet and not a, why, why is it not a triplet? Uh, because previously I have showed you a curve where you have three potential energy curves. Each one corresponds to one fine structure component of the rubidium minus. You can understand that now by the, by the fact that in the experiment there is an additional magnetic field always present. And this magnetic field uh, can actually mix the different uh, components of the different fine structure states. And that leads to a complication. It renders the molecular potential actually angular dependent. So far, I've only shown, showed you like um, um, plots where you have some dependence as a function of internuclear distance. But as soon as you quantify your quantization axis by a magnetic field, and you can have a perturb on, on many angles, it turns out that there is an angular dependence on the, uh, on the potential energy curves. You have to take that into account. But when you do that, then uh, you can uh, uh, make a theoretical model of the, uh, of the line shape that you would expect. And that's actually the, the, the solid line here. So that's not a fit. That's a true model potential, like a true modeling um, of, uh, of uh, the measurement data based on these angular dependent potential energy curves. And uh, from this, you can then actually extract the fine structure coupling of the rubidium lines. Um, so this fine, uh, so this duplet is, a, is an effect of fine structure plus presence of a magnetic field and from fitting uh, or from uh, um, now um, well, from from the measurements you can extract now the, this fine structure coupling directly and um, uh, this uh, gave us now a tool to have really new benchmarks on these uh, negative ion states that didn't exist uh, there was no measurement on this before it allowed us to um, uh, to assign phase shifts for all the three fine structure components uh, to extract positions of these shape resonances, to extract fine structure couplings, um, and uh, they uh, considerably deviated from, from previous uh, theoretical calculations on this by uh, on the order of uh, five to ten percent, like ten percent or so. Um, and uh, so this this is now a new benchmark experiments for the calculations maybe on these negative ion states uh, that uh, uh, that could be uh, maybe improved. Um, I told you that these um, uh, potential energy curves have uh, um, an angular dependence due to the presence of uh, the magnetic field and the mixing of the different fine structure components that leads to a funny effect because when you increase now the magnetic field uh, in, in the experiment you actually see that the uh, line shape kind of really qualitatively changes and that can be um, understand from two effects first of all uh, due to the larger magnetic field, you separate now different uh, potential energy curves just by the Zeeman uh, shift, uh, but also you kind of increase the absolute strength of this angular confinement. And when this angular confinement 
becomes larger and larger, you can have pendular states, like right? the or oriented states of the molecule um, uh, along the, the theta angle of your perturba. And uh, um, this kind of alignment process is only due to the, to the fine structure coupling in the negative line state. The, the ripple orbit, the electron orbit of, of the ripple state is completely <coughs> symmetric. Just because you have this fine structure splitting uh, in the negative ion, you get uh, an alignment of the molecule in the, in the lab. Um, so that, that's kind of a funny side effect that due to the fine structure coupling in the rubidium mines, you get alignment of the molecule, although the ripple orbit is purely spherically symmetric. <coughs> Okay, let me, for the last uh, 10, 15 minutes maybe, uh, switch topics and uh, go from negative ions and kind of the latest results and insights we gained into the physics of ultra-long-range triple molecules uh, to positive ions. So and in this uh, experiment, we asked ourselves the question, what can we contribute uh, to the field of uh, ultra-cold atom ion scattering? Uh, can we start from a ripper cloud in which we can prepare a single ripper excitation and only a single one because uh, we have strong ripper blockade uh, and use this single ripper excitation as a precursor to make a single ion and then maybe see at some point interaction of this ion with the surrounding atoms. Um, so we, we wanted to ask the question how can we make a very low energy ion uh, from a single ripper atom? And once we have it, how can we probe it as it moves through our gas? Um, let me start uh, with uh, the first part. How did we? How, how, how could we make a single ion from a single ripple atom? Uh, for this, we started out from a thermal gas um, at a pretty low density and a few microcalvin temperature. And um, uh, first of all, it's excited a single ripple atom in that gas using focused laser beam, so we precisely know where we excited, and we know that we only have a single ripple atom because ripple blockade uh, doesn't allow us to have a second one in the system at a time. Um, we did that again via our two photon scheme uh, to NS uh, ripple states in rubidium, and then we wanted to make a single ion from that single ripple atom, and this we did by another two photon. Uh, Photoionization scheme to go to the continuum. And so for this, we went back from the Rydberg state to the 6p, 3 half intermediate state, and then with the, uh, with the second photon just a little bit above the continuum threshold. And uh, that produces a, a single ion now. And by tuning uh, this second laser here just a little bit above the continuum threshold, you can essentially um, null the, the um, excess energy onto that ion that you. You can make a very low energy ion uh, with, a, uh, with such a scheme, and on top of this, this can be essentially done almost recurve free because the two wavelengths are almost the same. And you have only you know that you only have a single ion in the system. And uh, okay, so once you 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 uh, prepare that, and we show like that you can do that with uh, the efficiency of 80 percent, essentially limited um, by the lifetime of this 60 intermediate state uh, back to the ground state. Uh, how can you probe now the presence of this ion and maybe its motion through the gas? And for this we wanted to see uh, the ripple blockade on a second ripple excitation that we tried to excite subsequently to the production of the ion uh, in the presence of this single charge. So it's a ripple blockade that is not induced by, saying, by two ripple atoms but, but by the presence of one ion. And so how uh, um, can this be done? Well, you can now um, apply a, a small electric field to drag this ion away and then after a certain flight time you try to excite a second ripple atom at the same location um, and uh, because this ion here, uh, um, the Coulomb field of the ion and the strong polarizability of the ripple atom then gives rise to a blockade effect uh, you have a 1 over r to the 4 potential that describes the interaction between the ion and the ripple atom with a very strong C4 coefficient uh, so that you can get blockade radius uh, that can be up to tens of micrometer distances. And the typical interaction strength at these tens of micrometer distances is on the order of the megahertz uh, for the ripple space that we have chosen. Um, so, um, this, this defines the blockade radius as you have it for ripple ripper interactions, but here it's ion ripple interactions that it's like an ion induced ripple blockade. 
and uh, that's a measurement result for that. So this was done by having a, s a field with which we track the ion away from its initial uh, uh, position uh, for a few tens of microseconds. And what is plotted here is essentially the probability to excite a second Rydberg atom at the initial location. And then you see once the ion is far enough away, you can excite again a second Rydberg atom. And this sharp, trans or this sharp feature here, uh, this edge, can actually now be used to uh, measure the brocade radius. Um, we did that for several principal quantum numbers in a bit of a different way. We fixed the flight time of the ion and changed the electric field in our chamber, always on a, on a level of a few millivolt uh, per, per centimeter. Um, and you can do that for various principal quantum numbers now. And uh, you see always this sharp edge when you have uh, um, an electric field present, present that drags the ion far enough away that during that flight time you, you will go out of the brocade volume um, that is induced by that single charge. And then you can um, uh, um, monitor or you can uh, systematically study now the brocade radius as a function of the principal quantum number. We did that over a range from n equals 50 to up uh, um, to n equals roughly 100 and uh, the, the brocade radius can just, can just be uh, calculated from sim sim uh, simple uh, kinetics. Uh, you reach a uh, brocade volume that has a radius of about 10 to, to, to 20 uh, micrometer. And um, so this is all well understood. Um, I'd like to point out that this can now also be used to, um, uh, to uh, load your fields in the experimental volume. I mean, this thin line is a very precise field sensor now. You just have to make the flight time longer. <coughs> And longer, and then you get more and more precise to residual stray electric fields. And what is shown here is actually the measurement of these stray electric fields in our chamber using this single ion as a field sensor, as a field probe. And so that is a, um, uh, a measurement time of about um, one day and uh, indicates our typical field drifts, which are on the order of one millivolt per centimeter over a whole day. So that's kind of the level of field control that we have in using this single ion as a, as a field sensor, in each such experiment, we can now uh, measure the field to a level, or the, the stray electric field to a level of 100 uh, microvolt per centimeter um, precision. And uh, this brings me now kind of to the outlook, um, what we want to do next with this. Um, now we have this ability to trace essentially the ion in the ultra cold gas, and uh, this could be used uh, uh, to probe uh, many collisions between this ion and the surrounding ground state atoms. And for this, uh, the next step would be to increase the density of the background gas, essentially, finally, to go to a bose einstein condensate um, and try to uh, use this ion induced ripple brocade to measure um, the trajectory of an ion through a BEC, or to measure the resistance of the BEC, if you wish. The ohmic resistance is the true charge that you try to drag through a condensate. So, uh, this is related then to uh, uh, questions of ionic transport in a BEC. And, at these densities, you can also expect that you may see chemistry uh, like uh, we have heard from uh, Julius uh, this morning. Um, I would also like to um, emphasize that these type of experiments uh, we are planning to do also with in situ imaging of that ion using an ion microscope. That is a second setup that is now coming online, where we have an ultra cold gas, and on top of it, a 1.5 meter long tower that hosts three electrostatic lenses to image the ion position on a position sensitive uh, ion detector. Uh, and uh, we hope that uh, with this kind of uh, um, experimental uh, control, we uh, may reach uh, the regime of ion atom uh, quantum scattering, but from uh, the perspective of uh, someone who is doing Rupert physics. Um, so this is, this is coming online now, this uh, machine, and uh, uh, I'm very excited uh, for the um, with this, um, I'm at the end and would like to uh, thank the team. This certainly all happens around uh, Tillman and Stuttgart. Uh, these are the two um, uh, teams that work uh, on the two Ripperg experiments. And I would like to highlight specifically uh, Felix, the guy here. He did most of the work on the negative ion spectroscopy or uh, ultra long range Ripperg molecule spectroscopy to um, unravel the physics of rubidium minus. Um, and uh, then I would also like to uh, acknowledge our long-term theory collaborators on these things. 
And uh, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Yeah, concerning this river islands, not, uh, in principle, you could prove uh, a negative island. Uh, I'm sorry. Concerning these negative islands, uh, in principle, you could uh, probe them because you know this. Is why I was talking about stabilization. When you bring this rubidium plus into the presence of rubidium minus, then indeed these kind of resonance you can see them in the molecular potential curves because you see indeed starting from this p state, you see the trace of them in the pi manifold, whatever. I, I was just wondering if you ever thought about doing. In principle, you can probe that by doing some kind of photo association, direct direct photo association. And uh, that is that you have rubidium-2 molecular states. Some of them have the trace those potential of this one over R potential. So in principle, you have to go high enough, of course. But in principle, you, you could be able to look for direct photo association. Here, you use a trick not to do that. But uh, it seems to me that in principle, you, you would be able to, to, to probe that potential curve as well. Of course, it's not anymore in their physics, but just to say that uh, that would be another way to, to see them. I mean, we know that they are there because indeed you have to trace in, this, uh, in the molecular properties already. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I wonder if you if you ever told that one. So I haven't thought about it in yeah. much. Okay. Uh, I mean, what? If you, if you start from a molecule, then you may also ask what is then the effect of... Yeah, uh, there are many effects, many other effects. Here you measure the pure effect, yeah. I fully agree with yeah. that. But just to say that it was just another way to, to see those states appearing and to be sure that yes, indeed, they are wrong, they, are yeah. they exist indeed. Yeah. I mean, what you have here is also, I mean, if you have to think about the wave function overlap, when you start from yeah. a very yeah. tightly bound yeah. timer, maybe you can do that by using a flashback timer or something. Yeah. 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 I'm not so too much, but uh, I was more than... Could you then resolve this uh, little energy difference? Because this is the, 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 the this, uh, this is the point. I mean, the, it's not so little, by the way, because this uh, you're talking about the fine structure, which is like uh, uh, twenty wave, uh, like you know, a few dozens of wave numbers, right? So it is not small. The difference between the yeah. zero and one, two is not small. The point is just the, essentially the lifetime of the of the yes, okay. yeah. And um, uh, in a way, what you do here is, a, is an experiment where the Rydberg electron actually forms this, this negative line for a while, and it goes out again and it comes back. So you effectively, maybe this is also another way to do it. It's a, it's, you increase that lifetime because you have this frequency error. This and one from this thing was stabilization at the beginning. Yeah, then I agree with that. That's okay, so okay. <laughs> good. If you allow me to have another one, yes. okay, great. Um, just because uh, they saw in the other uh, part of the talk, when you say that you create that ion in the uh, rubidium cloud and then you put it there, so uh, right now you are doing this at the density that you are sure that this ion does not collide any other atom. Yeah. That you do, that the density is very low. Yes. Okay. Typical. Yeah, the typical densities for this experiment was 10 to the 12, and yeah. Yeah. Which is really quite high, right? Well, you, you have to consider the time scale, it's like 10 microseconds. Okay, okay. And so for this, you won't ex okay. expect collisions. But if you increase it by one or two orders of magnitude, yes, okay. go to 10 to the 13 in, in the condensate, and you just look on what is the long, long collision rate at these densities, then you're, you're in that regime. And so uh, you, you could actually hope to see collision effects once you're in that mm -hmm. these, And maybe also cancer. So you, you were talking about measuring on a transport through a condensate, so of course Langevin collisions would, would modify that, but also in, in your case, uh, charge exchange is resonant, right? So yes. the, I guess that would also have yes. a dominant contribution to the mobility yeah. of the ion. To the but I, I, I think that at the energies we probe the system, which is initially actually very cold, like it's uh, in the few microcalvin regime, depending on how well we can compensate stray electric fields, and then after, let's say, in a one millivolt per centimeter field, after a few microseconds, 10 microseconds, you, we, you get to collision energies which are more in the millicalvin regime. And then, 
in a 3D ensemble, I think it doesn't matter much if you have this resonant charge exchange on top because you have, if you think of um, a process, let's say it's if you don't have glancing collisions, but actually really spiraling, spiraling ones, and the longer radius in our case is really, really large, um, then you go out under like an isotropic angle anyways, and if you have like a, a charge exchange, I think it doesn't do anything on, on average. Yeah. Maybe at higher energies it does, but not at, not at one speed. But it would be, that would be the first goal to see some effects of collisions. And then ask the question like, how well can we compensate stray electric fields? Maybe we can get even better. We are, we can get better by an order of magnitude. And then in the first microseconds, you could maybe hope to see something that goes in the direction of. The answer was okay. Good. Then let's thank Florian again. Yeah.